Welcome to this discussion on third wave feminism. Today, I'm going to be talking about the writing of bell hooks, and I'm going to place it into the context of a larger discussion on third wave feminism. To get started here, I want to talk about um, bell hooks, and I want to talk about um, why you will always see her name lowercase. Um, so um, her um, given name is Gloria Jean Watkins. She was actually born um, in Kentucky, still alive as of uh, 2021. And um, she writes a lot um, about um, pop culture as well as um, her experience growing up in the Midwest and really um, is a, a very down to earth kind of figure. Um, but the reason why she, she goes by the pen name Bell Hooks is actually because it was her grandmother's name. In order to uh, bring honor uh, to her grandmother, she always uh, lowercases it so that uh, the uppercase uh, bell hooks will, will always belong to, to her grandmother. And um, one of the, the ideas um, that she coined was the notion of the oppositional gaze, which we will talk about um, later in this course, um, not, not today, um, but uh, there's just a fascinating amount of, of work that she's done, both in, in terms of discussing pedagogy, um, as well as philosophy and um, her notions of um, what feminism ultimately should, should be about. Um, Emma Watson, um, when she uh, gave her speech in front of the UN um, discussing why she was a feminist, actually cited bell hooks as the inspiration for her um, in becoming a, a feminist. And so that's why the picture of Emma Watson is, is uh, here on this slide as well. Um, but all that being said, um, I don't want to spend all day just praising and uh, talking about how wonderful Bell Hooks is. I want to actually jump into uh, the ideas that she presents in this essay. One of the first topics I want to explore today has to do with the criticism of second wave feminism that creates the standards um, that are present in third wave feminism. And so I'm going to spend a decent amount of time today talking about um, how third wave, uh, third wave feminism creates a criticism of second wave feminism. And what I think is important to understand about that criticism is that it's um, done in the manner of wanting to improve what feminism ultimately is. So a lot of what Bell Hooks says uh, in this essay um, that's directed against feminism really has to do with the question about who's becoming empowered um, through this women's movement, through um, the idea of, of feminism. And she directs a lot of her idea and criticism um, of second wave feminism against the person um, who's uh, at the front of, of the picture on the left hand side here, uh, Betty Friedan, because um, in a lot of ways, what she sees um, as a problem of second wave feminism has to do with its victimization of women who ultimately suffer the most by sexist oppression. And so um, at the beginning of, of this essay, she says that uh, you know, feminism up to that point hasn't really addressed the fact um, that the women who are the most victimized by sexist oppression um, have not really found a place in the, the feminist movement uh, up to that point. And one of the questions that, that she raises throughout this essay that we can also think about is just simply when we uh, talk about the patriarchy, um, that is the, the men who are in control of society, who benefits from that discussion about the patriarchy? That's not to say that we need to stop talking about the patriarchy. Um, and that's not to say that um, different people don't benefit uh, from, from the discussion about patriarchy. But one of the, the questions that Bell Hooks is really raising here has to do with um, what type of women become empowered through second wave feminism. And so uh, for her, when we look at um, the discussion about patriarchy, we can see it as a way of dividing women um, against each other. Going to what we, we said uh, in our, our Marxist section a little bit earlier, and we'll take a look at um, the, the kind of correlation between feminism and Marxism uh, today as well. Um, one, one of the ideas in, in Marxist writing is the fact that the, the ownership class comes up with 
a lot of unique strategies um, to hold uh, the, the working class in, in place. And that might even include the, the empowerment of certain people right, within the, uh, the working class, within the proletariat, um, in order to um, allow the, the ownership class to, to take control, right, to, to maintain control. And if we look at this um, cartoon that I have uh, on the slide, we can see that a similar kind of dynamic happens in feminism as well. When people use that idea of, of the patriarchy, um, we can see that it, it can be used um, by women uh, to disempower other women and also at the same point empower uh, certain women. And so if, if you look at it, you know, both, both women are, are evoking the patriarchy, right, a male dominated culture um, to have completely different views um, about how um, each one is, is supposed to dress. And so one of the things that uh, Bell Hooks raises in this essay is that she says the people, right, the women who are, are the most victimized by sexist oppression, um, they understand it in a similar way to, to how he said the labor understands their role in Marxism. That is, um, they don't necessarily know how to fight back against uh, this system of victimization. Um, they may even get to the point where that they've accepted it um, because they don't know how um, to fight against that kind of disempowerment. And on the same end, we might see that there are women um, certainly who benefit um, from a system of patriarchy where they are allowed to rule over other women. And so the second thing that she says here, a mark of their victimization is that they accept their lot in life without visible question, without organized protest, without collective anger or rage. Um, that's being directed towards the, the main ideas in second wave feminism that allowed um, these upper class white women to maintain control over other women and, and have professional careers for themselves at the cost of disempowering other women. One of the ways that we could talk about the differences um, between these upper class white women who really kind of take the reins of second wave feminism and some of the goals of third wave feminism is to start off by talking about um, the trope of the Mamie. Uh, sometimes also spelled M-A-M-M-I-E. And uh, what the Mamie is, is a stereotype um, of uh, larger sized women of color who took care of uh, the uh, children of white families. And what's interesting about the construct of the Mamie is that it's a mainstream part, um, particularly of, of Southern and uh, Midwestern culture, um, that uh, you, you see it not just in uh, the depictions that, that I have here, but also um, in uh, the different artifacts that are created um, through uh, Southern culture. It uh, even starts to find its way into various products uh, that are made. Probably the one that most people are, are most famous uh, or most familiar with, I mean, is um, the Aunt Jemima pancake mix. And one thing that we can point out right away is just simply to say that this particular trope, which um, has a presence in the psyche of, of, of people in the United States, is not a trope that any woman um, in second wave feminism ever really took seriously um, or ever had to deal with themselves. And yet it's unique to women. Um, it's not talking about uh, a, a status that, that men uh, had, to, had to deal with. Um, and yet there's, there's silence in second wave feminism um, about this idea of, of women. And so we could talk about an, a number of, of different constructs that are, that are like this. Um, there's also the one that's called the, the Sapphire or, or Jezebel um, that finds its way into a, a lot of different discussions. But the, the overarching point here is that there, there is a history um, that defines women that um, never is approached in second wave feminism because second wave feminism deals primarily with the empowerment, not of, of women, but of upper middle class white women. 
And so one of the big questions that we have to take up in Bell Hooks's writing has to deal with this question about what should happen when uh, women go on to their professional careers and children are left at home and um, a lot of housework has to be done. And again, Bell Hooks isn't arguing, well, we should stymie the progress of women because um, if we allow them to have professional careers, that means there won't be anyone there to take care of the children. There won't be anyone there to, to maintain the home. Um, but instead, she, she's kind of pointing out that Betty Friedan's writing in The Feminine Mystique, which again it itself is, is a popularized version of Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. Uh, she says as much in The Feminine Mystique, um, but again, Simone de Beauvoir, when she wrote The Second Sex, wrote it from an existential and phenomenological view about what uh, it meant to, to become a woman. Um, and Betty Friedan's writing in The Feminine Mystique deals a lot more um, with how, how to empower yourself as a woman um, and, and fight the patriarchy to go on and, and have a career. And um, what, what Bell Hooks points out in this essay is that there's a real lack of imagination in how Betty Friedan writes The Feminine Mystique um, in terms of, of understanding what the empowerment of, of women can really look like. Um, for, for Hooks, uh, you know, this question of, of dealing with um, who's going to take care of the children and how are we going to maintain the home and how are we going to get all of these things done, all of these things done um, are, are a question for, for the, the structures of patriarchy themselves. And what she sees in the um, ideas that Friedan uh, ultimately espouses is really just a recreation of the patriarchy. Um, and it's really just basically taking the, the issues that women have and uh, passing them on to, to other women in order to empower certain women. And so um, if you want to be a lawyer, you know, if you want to uh, start your own company, if you want to uh, go on and have uh, a professional career in, in some way, all you have to do is to find the right kind of domestic help the right kind of mamies to come in and take care of your children and do all the things that you would have, and then you can be equal to a man. And so the problem that Bell Hooks is pointing out here is the fact that second wave feminism, from the standpoint that Betty Friedan uh, espouses in the feminine mystique, um, really is a, is a model of, of the same system, the same structures that are in place um, that manipulate people um, into um, subservience that happen in patriarchy. And for her, a true feminist idea has to be uh, greater than, than just that. One of the obvious problems in Betty Friedan's analysis about the lives of women happens to be, as uh, Bell Hooks points out, this lack of consideration for the lives of, of women who've already come before Betty Friedan. Um, I know I've mentioned it several uh, times in, in class, um, but the book that I have listed up here at the top left-hand corner, um, I, can't, I can't recommend enough. It's by Sadia uh, Hartman, um, and um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful book um, about um, just what life was, was like for a lot of different uh, um, women of color in uh, the, the post kind of, or, or during, I should say, uh, the, the Jim Crow era. Um, I've also, in the middle here, have, have another book um, by Iceberg Slim uh, called uh, Pimp, the Story of, of My Life, um, which uh, both um, uh, Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock have, have mentioned were very influential in, in uh, their own uh, lives. And it actually, um, going back to what we were saying about Marxism earlier, is it's a pretty interesting kind of Marxist analysis um, in, in some ways of uh, what, what life is like being a pimp. But Bell Hooks points out that there, there's already all these different professions um, that women of color have, have embraced, aside from um, helping a different uh, you know, white families with, the, again, this kind of popular trope of, of uh, the mamie. Um, and I'm putting that in quotation marks as I, as I say that. Um, but a, a lot of them are, are disempowering um, kinds of, of professions. And um, a lot of them 
are subserving it towards the the will of of, of white people and um interestingly enough within those identities you still see um this uh, kind of complex view of, of what identity can be. And um, there's a lack of acknowledgement um, from the feminist movement about these different forms of life that exist as well. Um, to two important things that Hooks doesn't really uh, mention in this essay, but um, she has talked about in other places, and I, I think it's also just important uh, for, for describing. Um, is, is first of all that the legacy of, of, of slavery and, and how it ultimately um, defines relationships um, between individuals. So one thing that Sadia Hartman uh, points out in this uh, book, Wayward Lives and Beautiful Experiments, that I think is really important to, to mention here um, in uh, our discussion of third wave feminism, happens to be the adoptive strategies um, that uh, people of color have to take in a Jim Crow kind of era where the police are constantly harassing you, um, you know, locking you up for very small crimes like loitering and then you know, throwing you on these chain gangs and ultimately, um, in a lot of ways, just disrupting uh, the lives that you have. Um, and um, one of the, the things that Sadia Hartman points out that I think is, is an interesting study um, happens to be uh, this in, in a for a lot of, of white families, there's this nuclear family kind of model of what life is supposed to be like. Um, but if you think about uh, Jim Crow era and this disruption of uh, men's lives, um, again, where they're arrested for very small crimes, thrown on these uh, chain gangs where they can be convict leased, um, and in some cases back to the plantations um, that they had just been freed from, in other cases being forced to go into mining uh, camps and all, all kinds of, of different things. Um, what Sadia Hartman points out is that uh, this is an interesting uh, dynamic for how family emerges in the Jim Crow era. Because ultimately, she points out um, that there, there's a, a, a larger kind of uh, lesbian culture um, that, that ensues from this. You also start seeing people um, building the, these strategies of identity that allow for a more fluid um, identity um, it, it, in a lot of ways, moves away from a nuclear family kind of a view. And ultimately, what I think is, is really interesting in, in her book uh, happens to be the um, identity around a, a matriarch uh, in, in the family when, when there is a more nuclear kind of, of view of the family. Is that instead of building it around one uh, you know, central male figure, um, which is often the case in nuclear families, you see the strategy of uh, building around a, a matriarch. And I, I'd say that that's a legacy that, that's very common even today um, in uh, families of, of people of, of color where um, a, a matriarch tends to be the person um, who the family is, is centered uh, around. And so um, I'd also just point out that the, the legacy that we're talking about within feminism, as I mentioned beforehand, um, you know, it, it's often dated back to Mary Wollstonecraft um, but if we if we look at it um, from its, its standpoint of not being a, a higher class movement and it being truly a Rosie the Riveter uh, kind of view, we, we can see that um, lots of women of color worked in the factories, um, you know, worked uh, during World War II in um, the same capacities that we would think of as uh, lower class men working and, you know, in some cases even working lower things like you know, be, being the cook and, and things like that. And um, we can even look at the feminist movement as an outgrowth of, of the woman that I have here on the bottom right, Sojourner uh, Truth. And um, her uh, legal uh, uh, battle to, to uh, win the, the rights of her children, and she was the first successful uh, case to win uh, her, her children out of uh, slavery from, from a legal standpoint. Um, but there's, there's a big history um, that Hooks is pointing out is ignored by Betty Friedan. 
Um, the, the woman I have here at the, at the top right hand corner um, is Maybelle Hampton, who was a, an early uh, proponent of um, uh, lesbian rights. Uh, she was born, I believe, in, in 1902. And uh, what's interesting about her is is that uh, sh she became famous. Uh, she she was a, a dancer and um, uh, an actor and and many other things. Um, and she got to a point in in her life where uh, she had to go back to work. And so the way she started working was um, working for for white families. You know, being a, uh, um, a domestic uh, you know servants. Uh, and basically doing uh, the things that uh, white people had had her do for a while um, and then move back in, in, into fame again. Um, and in uh, each of these cases, we can see that the people who, who are being discussed have a very different uh, type of life than the one that Betty Friedan um, ultimately prescribes towards women. Um, and yet they, they build their lives um, with an identity that we would say is consistent with the goals of, of feminism. At the bottom left-hand corner here, I have an individual um, named Gladys Bentley. And um, in the uh, section below this video, um, if you look at um, the, <laughs> the, the list that I have there, um, I have a link to a video about Gladys Bentley. Um, if you are watching this for, for class credit, I want you to click on that video of Gladys Bentley, and I want you to write down the three facts that you find interesting about Gladys Bentley's life. Um, again, if you're watching this for class credits, uh, I want you to click on that video of Gladys Bentley life, and I want you to write down three things that you think are interesting um, about her life. Uh, and that's uh, the, the credit that you'll get for, for class today. So all of that uh, being said, again, if, if we look at this as, as a uh, on the whole, one of the, the, the major problems is the fact that Betty Friedan and second wave feminism in general um, do not consider the lives um, of individuals who do not fit um, into this, this uh, uh, round peg <laughs> uh, kind of, of, of view of, of what a woman's life is supposed to be like. So really, we can extend this analysis um, to a further discussion, which is really um, at the heart of this essay, the fact that uh, second wave feminism really never considered the problems of racism in their critique of sexism. And we can see this on the uh, whole um, in, in a way where, again, if, if we think about feminism as this idea of trying to defeat patriarchy, trying to stop uh, sexism, um, trying to expose the uh, power structure of society that pushes back against women, uh, then there's a real problem with the way in which second wave feminism uh, ultimately empowers women. Because it really, in a lot of ways, disempowers the dissenting voices that are part of uh, feminism by stymieing um, or stifling um, the voices of uh, women of color, um, the LGBTQIA uh, community, um, pretty much every group of, of individuals that are not upper class white women. And um, by the same point, we see that it empowers um, privileged cisgender white women, um, mostly by disempowering women of, of color. And so I've, I've got two very different examples here um, to kind of speak to that. Um, the, the first one is uh, Gone with the Wind, where uh, the lady who is uh, taking care of, of uh, Scarlet in uh, this picture, her name is actually Mamie. Um, but you can see a way in which um, the character herself, who is considered to be one of the strong kind of feminine roles um, and again, uh, Gone with the Wind is uh, one, one of the, well, is after Birth of the Nation, the second biggest uh, box office hit um, in the United States. We, we can see, though, that the, the status of, of Scarlet as being a woman affects what type of heroine she ends up being. And at the same point, 
we can see that all women of color in the movie are subservient towards her will. And if we move up and look at Taylor Swift here, um, Bell Hooks points out how common this is in pop culture to this day, where um, instead of including women of color in um, things like you know being the heroine and, and being uh, the the main kind of feature, um, we we use them as as props, um, as as the background uh, in in order to enhance um, white women, privileged women, um, to enhance uh, their own status. And so this is her main criticism of second wave feminism is that ultimately this is what second wave feminism does is that it uses women of color, um, lower class women, um, basically all, all women who are not privileged cisgender, white, uh, upper uh, to middle class women, um, it uses them in order to empower um, the privileged cisgender, upper class, white women. So one of the interesting analysis um, that exists in this essay and is also uh, relevant to the essay that you have to write for the end of the semester is how um, Bell Hooks analyzes Marxism from a feminist standpoint. And so she integrates a lot of different Marxist ideas um, within this essay, but she also um, separates her own ideology out um, from a Marxist view and shows in some ways its inadequacy. Um, towards a, a feminist view. And so what I want to do is I, I want to first start off by talking about the separation of a Marxist view from a feminist view. And then I want to talk about the similarities um, between a Marxist view and a feminist view. And so one, one of the things that she um, locates in this essay is the commonality of class struggle with the feminist movement. Um, and uh, she ultimately uses the Marxist distinction about uh, race um, in the beginning by, by talking about the fact that she thinks race and class are, um, as she says, inextricably bound uh, together. Um, so she sees the class of racism as very similar to the way we described in, in Marx as um, a, a class struggle where race is a class distinction. Um, but then she goes on and, and actually says uh, something to, in her analysis that I think is in, important for how we end up distinguishing a, a Marxist view from a feminist view. And that happens to be um, the relationship to the means of production. And so she says, um, using an analysis of a couple of different authors here, she, she points out that class um, is more than just the relationship to the means of production. And she gives us a pretty exhaustive list of uh, some of these other relationships that exist. So she says that you know, class is um, your behavior and how you're taught to behave, your basic assumptions about life, what you expect from others and yourself, your concept of a future, and ultimately how you understand problems and, and solve them. And so um, we might look at that and um, say, well, I'm, I'm not for sure how, how true that um, right? how, how, how different, for instance, is that from, from the means of production? Isn't your behavior and how you're taught to behave uh, a productive form of, um, <laughs> of expression? And again, um, I, I think it's, it's worth noting what we've talked about already in class about the relationship between performance and production. Um, and, and again, for, for Marxist analysis, um, emphasis is often placed on the performance over what uh, is actually produced, what is what is created. And um, I, I can't emphasize enough how important that is from a, a feminist uh, analysis. Um, again, Judith Butler go, goes on um, in her own uh, analysis um, and, um, to, to talk about the importance of performance. Um, and, and for her, gender is performance. It um, is, is intimately tied together when we when we're referring to gender, we're referring to a, a social construct um, in Judith Butler's analysis, which ultimately leads to uh, a performance of, of some kind that, that's expected. Um, but if we go back to this and, and talk about it in one other um, sort of uh, light, we might also look at it in terms of, of trying to describe um, what uh, an assumption about life um, actually looks like. And um, what we've discussed so far 
has to do with certain assumptions that are being made about what life is like for women. And so if we think about what Sadia Hartman has, uh, uh, or what I was saying Sadia Hartman uh, had said about the expectations of, uh, of life, the assumptions about life, and you're growing up in the Jim Crow era as a woman of color, um, and um, let's say you, you identify as, as a lesbian, what you expect from other people and what you expect from yourself is very different. Uh, what, what your concept of a future is, is very different than if you're growing up as the wife of um, a well-off lawyer who has hired domestic help to raise your, your children while you go through a, a professional school. It's not to say that both um, are uh, without challenges because b both do in fact have um, extreme forms of challenges. But to condense them into saying that they that they suffer from the same type of sexist oppression is to misunderstand um, what kind of struggle is actually happening between both of them. And so this is why Bell Hooks locates um, the, the feminist struggle in terms of, of class struggle first. But it's not just women of color that she's talking about here. It, it's all women who um, suffer through a, a class kind of struggle. And again, even if you are a, a poor uh, white woman, your, your struggle as a poor white woman is going to look different than the struggle of an upper class white woman. And um, by the same token, uh, struggle of, of a poor white woman is going to look different um, than the struggle of, of a poor woman of, of color. Um, so even though both of you share the fact that, that you're poor, um, there's different privileges that are embedded within the institutions of society itself to be able to change uh, those those statuses. So as we go through and, and we think about this, we can see it reflected in the actions of individuals. Um, even that, that first uh, idea again about how uh, you are taught to behave. Um, you know, we can think about uh, certain uh, behaviors that again, um, looking through it from, from a Marxist interpretation of, of the upper class. And when we go back and, and, and think about um, what we said, uh, how middle class children and lower class children often find themselves needing to be productive in order to, to feel uh, like they're, they're being themselves. Um, and that's, that's a behavior that's not adopt, uh, adopted of the upper class society, of the upper class mentality, where um, individuals uh, are, are free to do whatever <laughs> uh, they want, so they don't have to. Uh, feel the need to be productive in order to be themselves. Um, and if we extend that analysis even further towards ideas about race, uh, we'll, we'll find uh, at the end of the day that uh, there's even a, a, a larger extent uh, to which uh, those, those double binds that Simone de Beauvoir was talking about uh, become, become true. Uh, so much so that W.E.B. Du Bois in The Soul of Black Folks um, actually coins this term, what he calls uh, double consciousness, where um, today we, we might think of this as, as uh, code switching um, or um, even uh, to, to a further extent of, of just, um, you know, a double identity where uh, you have to present yourself one way um, when you are with an, another uh, group of people and against that consciousness or against that identity, uh, you have to present yourself a, a different way when you're with your with your fa friends and, and family. Um, and so that last idea there of, of how you understand problems and solve them, um, it is a class distinction, um, but as we move towards a, a more feminist analysis um, and, and not just a, a Marxist analysis here, um, we can say that one of the problems about understanding problems is that you, you do it sometimes through a multiplicity of identities that conflict with themselves. And it's not always a, a clear cut answer uh, from a single identity, which is the privilege that is inscribed in second wave feminism. So I wanna talk about uh, third wave feminism and the specific tenets of, of third wave feminism. Um, and I will uh, present those at the, at the end of the discussion here. But I think it's important to look at how uh, Hooks falls back on a Marxist critique of second wave feminism, um, because even though she, she's able to uh, talk about uh, how 
uh, Marxist analysis doesn't go far enough um, in examining uh, f feminism. Uh, she does still use a, a Marxist view to talk about the limitations of second wave feminism. Um, and uh, she actually begins this by, by describing how it's important to look at uh, the aspects that are alienating of feminism towards other women. And for her, she thinks that uh, women need to, to collect these experiences, um, put, to put them together and, and give voice uh, to those experiences. And so in, in understanding that, um, she also talks about how feminism itself as a uh, production becomes uh, something that uh, serves serves the interests of the most privileged of women and in a way becomes a parody of, of the need for feminism because of its disempowerment of, of other women. And so I'm um, looking at this, it's, it's very similar to how uh, Marx describes production um, as something that is antithetical to, towards the labor. Um, and um, we can really, uh, we'll talk about how we can extend this analysis to, to nearly uh, every movement. I, I think feminism offers a, a very uh, uh, good and, and uh, obvious uh, way of understanding, and again, how, how we might see any kind of movement from, from a Marxist lens. And so again, um, she, she points out the fact that, that feminism um, because it continues the interest of the most privileged of women, um, it uh, becomes important for uh, women who benefit from from second wave feminism to be less critical of of feminism and to stifle the critical voices of women in order uh, to allow it to to um, <laughs> gain authority to to gain uh, steam as as a movement, and so. When we, when we look at that, uh, she makes this distinction that I think is really interesting about the difference between oppression and exploitation. And um, she talks about how second wave feminism um, uses the notion of exploit, I'm sorry, uses the notion of oppression for exploitive purposes. Um, and so again, uh, organizing all of women's experiences under the banner that all women are oppressed doesn't talk about the diversity of experiences that women have and doesn't talk about unique challenges to particular women that are not seen in the lives of, of other women. And this is why she thinks it's exploitive is because, um, again, it's, it's organizing all of these different experiences of women under one experience, the experience of oppression. And so for her, that, that's um, a very clear example of exploitation within second wave feminism, um, because it's not trying to understand women, but it's trying to say that it understands the experiences of women as being the, the same kind of experience. And so um, one of the other interesting things that we can use from a Marxist analysis here is that once there's that system of production in place of what feminism is supposed to be, and we have it moving towards a single goal, um, then in, in order for the, the people who are in charge of it to maintain their authority, they have to uh, also be able to maintain the system of impression that is intact within the feminist discourse of second wave feminism. And so when we bear that in mind, um, again, for, for Marx, uh, capitalism has a lot of ways of adapting to um, the uh, uh, markets. Um, capitalism has a lot of flexibility um, within the, the barriers that are put out in front of it. Um, but for Marx, capitalism is unsustainable because it's an irrational system. And if we look um, in feminism, it's, it's the same idea that's here. There's a lot of different ways in which um, privileged women can impress women who are disempowered. Um, there's a lot of different strategies that can be adopted again, in order to, to uh, posit the fact that feminism is serving the interest of, of women. Um, but when we look at it and when we see, well, really what has happened is that um, the, the patriarchy that's being criticized has been recreated in a different system of power that allows um, a very small percentage of women to have power over a very large percentage of women. We can see that the system itself is irrational. What it, what it says it's producing, that is equality for all women, empowerment for all women, 
recognition of the rights of all women is actually not what it is performing, um, which is, again, uh, allowing just a certain class of women to move up, allowing a certain class of women uh, to be elevated against the rest. And so because of that, um, she's, she points out that the system of oppression, um, it has to, for the second wave feminist view, um, it has to be maintained um, in order for um, those women who are uh, privileged, who are at the front of the discourse, um, to be able to see themselves as mediator um, between uh, these, these other women and, and men. And for her, um, that's the system of oppression that has to also be dismantled. And so um, she points out that uh, the, the irrationality and um, again, the incompleteness of this thinking really ultimately finds expression in the fact that it starts to use the language of victimization to hide the victimizing of, of other women. And probably the place where this becomes the most obvious is in her discussion of Lillian Hellman, where Lillian Hellman describes how she felt that her, um, uh, you know, uh, nursemaids, uh, the, the women of, of, of color who, um, you know, helped raise her, the, the domestic help that her parents hired, she felt that they had power over her um, because, uh, you know, she was li little, she was a child and she didn't feel like she had the authority to, uh, you know, uh, disagree with the, the hired help. And um, Bell Hooks points out that, um, you know, this, this view um, doesn't take in the fact that a, a nine-year-old has the power to fire somebody um, just because they don't like them. It, it gives a nine-year-old the, the power um, over um, an adult, which should, should never, you know, happen. Um, from from Hooks's standpoint, and from from most political theorists' uh, standpoint as well, and so um, the narrative of disempowerment itself um, becomes estranged because it no longer is is looking at the world from from a rational point of view. And again, if we think about this um, in in terms of how Marx describes the the relationship of the uh, labor and ownership class. Um, we see a very similar kind of dynamic um, existing here in the privilege that's afforded to upper uh, and middle uh, class white women that is um, never given to, to any type of, of woman of color or, or woman who doesn't fit the narrative of second wave feminism. As we look at this analysis that Hooks has given us as a model for third wave feminism, it's important to keep in mind that she's not just talking about class and race distinctions, but ultimately this collectivity of voices that she's concerned with includes the voices of women outside women of color. Um, she is concerned with this dynamic of disempowerment as a way of empowering voices that um, had, again, not equal power in society, um, not equal privilege status, um, but using people who have been othered in society to create a sense of, of power um, through people who have already been disempowered. And so what's important is, as we think about that is that this kind of analysis can really be extended to any form of otherness that exists in society. While we're talking specifically about otherness in terms of um, race and, and, and class here, we could just as easily talk about it in, in terms of otherness um, that transgendered people um, experience. We could talk about it in a more socioeconomic context. We could talk about it as otherness that is experienced by, uh, for instance, Muslim Americans. Um, we could talk about otherness in the sense of uh, immigrant or migrant uh, uh, Americans. So there's several different ways that we could look at the experiences of, of women and come to understand that um, this analysis isn't just true for women of color, but it's for women across a broad spectrum of different experiences. Um, a lot has been written about um, using this particular kind of analysis in Disney films and looking at how Disney films villainize um, individuals. 
And um, we can kind of see a, a trend line that exists in, in Disney films um, between the use of villainizing uh, what we would think of as, as a queerness um, or estrangement uh, kind of feeling in society and trying to make that um, also the villain of, of a Disney story. Um, a lot of different film critics kind of point out the fact as we move closer towards the Pixar world, um, we move more and more away from villainizing people in Disney film to villainizing ideas um, or uh, villainizing um, <laughs> not necessarily persons, but, um, you know, again, an, an idea that um, <laughs> permeates the, the stratus of, of society. But if we look um, to, towards the beginning of, of Disney, all, all the way through its um, animated film history, we see that there is a, a particular emphasis on trying to villainize um, the form of queerness that we might see. And in particular, um, Ur Ursula, uh, like Disney film writers admit this, that Ursula was uh, you know, um, recreated after um, a famous drag queen divine um, for the features um, that, that she had. And as we look at um, just, again, different Disney villains, we, we can see that there is an emphasis on using a particular kind of color um, to emphasize uh, uh, what a villain looks like. And again, on a particular kind of trope of, um, you know, uh, a de-sexed individual usually, or um, in the case where sexuality is known, it's a deviant uh, kind of sexuality. And um, as you go through and, and look at uh, different films. You know, the, the villain is, is always either the person who lives alone, um, or we might be able to read into the Disney villain type of um, sexuality that's, um, you know, atypical uh, sexuality, um, whether it's, um, again, a, a non-binary kind of identity, um, or um, even, uh, you know, a gay, lesbian kind of uh, thing that we could read into the, the villain. Disney has a history of, of, of taking the otherness of individuals and uh, producing from that otherness a form of villainy. Um, and so as we look at this kind of extension of, of again, analyzing, well, who is it um, that gets disempowered through the empowerment of whatever individuals we're, we're particularly focusing on there? Um, it's, it's worth reflecting that a lot of times our understanding of why people are estranged in society or our understanding of why people are alienated from society comes from a dynamic of power um, that doesn't really consider the experiences of the individual, the uniqueness of the individual. And it's on that particular dynamic that Bell Hooks is really resting the force of this essay that we should consider if we're going to be a true feminist movement, that we should consider the experiences of the other, whoever that may be, and whatever society we may be describing. And so based off of that dynamic, um, when we consider, well, what does third wave feminism actually mean? What does it stand for? It really goes to this idea of considering the experience of, of otherness. And so within this writing, um, we have to understand a couple of different things about the experiences that Bell Hooks is leaning on here in talking about women of color. Um, she points out that there is actually a unique benefit to having multiple experiences of oppression um, that, again, get exploited. And um, she says that the benefit of this is that women of color, because they don't have the ability to move between role of victimizer and oppressor, like white women, where they can lean on their role as uh, women to, to um, uh, feel uh, the oppression or, or to talk about oppression, and um, they can lean on their um, you know, race uh, caste in order to be able to, to oppress others, or like black men who can lean into their role um, of, again, being oppressed through their, their race caste, um, or um, lean into their, their status as, as being men um, to fulfill the role of, of oppressor. Um, because um, she says that women of color lack this ability to lean into multiple roles like that. She says that there is a benefit 
um, towards it that is informative of third wave feminism. She says, there is a lack of an other for women of color to be able to oppress. And so she says, because of that, um, women of color are not concerned with, with dominating in any particular type of group of, of person. And for her, this is significant in understanding how third wave feminism should ultimately form. Um, because for her, we ultimately, for thinking about that collective responsibility of, of uh, giving voice to people who have become alienated, to the women who have become alienated, then we need to look at the collective responsibility to be able to speak towards those experiences um, in order to end the domination that ultimately seems to, to be a relic um, of the disempowerment of, of other women. And from that standpoint, she thinks that really the big idea in third wave feminism and the thing that distinguishes it from both Marxism and from second wave feminism is this idea of ending domination by moving towards a collective understanding of the individual that begins with self-actualization. And so if we go back through and, and look at uh, kind of the progression that we made between Hegel and, and Marx up to feminism, it's really for bell hooks trying to reclaim in a lot of ways this idea of self-actualization by trying to understand not just our experiences but again how our experiences fit into the collectivity of other people's experiences and so going with that the final idea here is that we also need to be able to question um, what it is that we have seen betrayed as being wrong in society because of its estrangement. And so when we don't have a common experience that somebody else has, we have a tendency to again, villainize it and say, well, then there's something wrong with that because I don't have that experience. It's something different or unique to me. Um, I've never had that encounter before. And instead of having that kind of knowledge, what we should do is question why it has been villainized. We should question what are the other voices that surround this particular dynamic? What are the other ways that we can consider it that we maybe haven't considered before? And as a preview towards the movie that you're going to watch, I would say that this photo that I have here at the very end is significant in understanding how it is that we might be able to question what has been portrayed as wrong because of its estrangement. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email.